This morning, we'll look at Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. We'll look at Isaiah's promise that a shoot will come up out of the stump of Jesse. From the root of Jesse, a tree will bear fruit. And we will see that promise fulfilled today in the gift of Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. We'll see that Isaiah's promise is filled with hope and glory, and we will be and are the recipients of his wonderful life. Christmas is coming. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours today from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. There's a ring of immortality in the prophecies of Isaiah, the foremost gospel writer in the Old Testament. They've come down to us through the centuries with tremendous power and tremendous hope. And in our days, we've seen their fulfillment. For us, they bring to our ears the wonderful chimes of Christmas bells. They remind us of the message of the coming Christ. And so when we hear them, we rejoice. And our hearts rejoicing are lifted up as we come to God in search of his divine guidance and and for his encouragement. You know, in our nation, I would say, probably in the last century, we have been very much, in many ways, like the people of Judah, the church of the Old Testament. We've seen our ups and downs. We've seen changes in the last century that some can be explained, some are inexplicable. And if you know about the people of Judah in that day, in the time of Isaiah, about 700 years before the the Christ, then you'll know that the church in that day was struggling. It had gone into a dark period of sleep and slumber that for many generations the church had in fact in Isaiah's day and well before fallen into some of the vicious, some of the, the terrible idolatries of the nations around them. Their moral code had dropped. Their ethics had fallen away. They were not frequently frequenting the Lord's temple and the Lord himself had been alienated by them from their society. False messages, false gods had invaded the temple of the Lord. And now upon the throne of David, an ineffectual and effeminate ruler who no one had any trust in at all. His leadership style presented no hope for anyone. Which probably explains his cowardice in turning not to the God of Israel, but to the Assyrian Empire and their worldly power in hopes of defeating the Babylonians who stood against him. And we, the Church of Christ, in this day and age, perhaps should take a lesson from the events surrounding the prophet Isaiah. This last of the line of David, Isaiah spoke to. He came to him with a promise. He offered him hope and God had even given to the king a sign that should have assured him that God's power and protective care were with the people of Israel. But he turned him down. He turned away from the God of Israel. He rejected the message of Isaiah. He wouldn't even give it a hearing. And so the people and the king went on their merry way in their stubbornness and their denial of God to their own self-destruction. The Babylonians would be the one whom God would bring in judgment upon the nation and they would saw off the tree of David and only a better stump remained and they would be carried off into captivity. 
And the temple of God would be destroyed and the city of God would be destroyed because God would give them exactly what they wanted and they offered no hope, no desire for God. And so he withdrew his hand for a time to allow them to have exactly what they wanted. Now, we don't dare make this too close of an analogy to our history, other than to say that sin is rampant, up is down, down is up, and our society, which was once a strong Christian society, is now struggling in these postmodern times. And many have gone off to other messages, and many have abandoned the church and fallen asleep in their faith. And like the people of Israel, some of us have become apathetic. But God is a God of love. And God gave them a message of condemnation and followed immediately with a word of hope. In this illustration of Isaiah today, there is only one reason for their tragic stubbornness. And that is they were so entangled by the deceits of Satan, so involved in their own lives and their own sins, so enamored with the false gods of the worlds or the nations around them that there was no turning back. David's dynasty died in the year 586 B.C. Isaiah compares Judah's destiny with the house of David in this parable or in this illustration that he gives in his prophecy. He said it will be humbled in the height of its glory and the Davidic dynasty would be exalted in the time of its deepest humiliation. He also said, behold, a branch is growing from the decimated stump, not of David, but of Jesse. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From its roots a branch will bear fruit. It's a cut off stump. There's no question there. That's the word. It had been cut down and most stumps last about seven years before they begin to rot. And by the time that this stump had begun to rot and there was no hope left, a glimmer of life would shoot up. A little sprig would begin to grow. But why was the Messiah here? This is really interesting. Called the descendant of Jesse. Not of David. Well, we might say, well, perhaps because of the prophecies of the Old Testament, he would be born in the town of Jesse in the city of Bethlehem. And that might be right in part, but I think... A little more importantly here, if we follow the illustration of the prophet Isaiah, what we're going to find is that David's house had so deteriorated by the time that the Christ came along that it was of bitter repute. That it was nothing more than a reprehensible and once noble family that had come to mean conditions. And so what we have here is that God would have Isaiah name it better after Jesse, the father of David, than David himself. And from that humble beginning, the glory of Israel would return. And so, we find a beautiful passage in Ezekiel chapter 17 that roughly parallels the prophecy of Isaiah. And we know that God's word is a whole and there it shouldn't surprise us. But listen to the prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 17, beginning there in the 22nd verse. The prophet writes, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will take a shoot from the very top of a cedar and plant it. I will break off a tender sprig from its topmost shoots and planted on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain heights of Israel I will plant it. I will, it will produce branches and bear fruit and become a splendid cedar. Birds of every kind will nest in it. They will find shelter in the shade of its branches. All the trees of the forest will know that I, the Lord, bring down the tall tree and make the low tree grow tall. I dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken. 
I will do it. And so, endowed with this seer's vision, the prophet Isaiah is speaking through the Holy Spirit from God himself, beholds a far off, faint, faintly distant future in which the figure of the Son of God standing at the river Jordan and the Spirit of God descending from heaven upon him now imbues him with the heavenly gifts that will make him our prophet, our priest, and our king. So it's with majestic power that Isaiah writes, the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The Spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The Spirit of counsel and of power. The Spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And I hope you caught it. It says, not the Spirit of God, Rah Elohim, Elohim being God in general, but the Spirit of of the Lord, Rah Yahweh, the Lord, the God of Israel, the personal and private name by which Israel knows the covenant God, who is their God, their protector, their redeemer, and their savior. This is the Holy Spirit who will reside on the Christ, and his the Spirit will bring these perfect gifts, and he doesn't lift all the perfect gifts of this that the Lord God, the Lord Jesus Christ in his, man, in his humanity, <clears throat> excuse me, will receive. But he does call it wisdom and understanding, counsel and power and knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. There's a difference here in the way the Holy Spirit imbues the prophets and imbued the Christ. When the Spirit of God comes upon the prophets, he comes for a short time with a specific message. And then when the message is done, the Spirit of God returns to the glory of heaven with all of his prophetic gifts. But upon the Christ at the River Jordan, the Spirit of God did not come tempor temporarily upon Jesus, but the Scripture says, it rested upon him. It was there continuously and it did not leave him. It was necessary in his humanity, not in his divinity, but in his humanity that he should have the spirit of the Lord continuously and lastingly. St. John clearly witnesses to this in the gospel when he says, then John the baptizer gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And so Isaiah speaks of the Holy Spirit. He says the spirit of wisdom of, and understanding, of counsel and power, of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. But really the word wisdom captures them all beautifully. Because you see, wisdom is not only knowing what is good and desirable from God, godliness, but it's the desire to do those things that God has placed in our heart to do. To live the life we've been called to live. To live that Christian life, falling and being raised up and falling and being raised up. To live it in the glory of Christ. With all of our humanity and with all of the glory it means to be both saint and sinner. That's what wisdom is all about. And Christ was the man upon whom the Spirit resided. Because he took on our humanity. humanity, He became the word made flesh who dwelt among us. He was the necessary one, Emmanuel, enriched by these gifts that he might subsequently share them and you and I in our humanity as redeemed children of God might share those blessings with him in the glory of Christ forever. In that day, 
The root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples and the nations will rally to him and his place of rest, his temple, his abode will be glorious. The root of Jesse is a messianic title. And Isaiah trumpets it loudly. He will be a banner for the people. He will be a rallying point upon the field of battle as a national ensign is raised up to rally the troops and go forward to lead the way. So Christ upon the battlefield of the cross is raised up high that all the nations of the world might see Him and rally to Him. He is the one to whom all the nations will come and rejoice. He is the one that brings peace with God where the lion and the lamb lay down together. He is the one that brings true spiritual peace through the cross for you and I in this Advent season. Because it's through the cross, through David's family being lifted up, for that tree to be seen by all the nations, that God's saving purpose for you and I is accomplished. He is the bearer of our salvation. And so God will renew the stump of David's kingdom, Isaiah promises. It wouldn't be a restoration of an earthly rule or a Davidic kingdom in the Holy Land. Not at all. It will be a far greater, more extensive kingdom. God had great things in mind. God's son, David's greater son, would renew the earth and heaven in a new heaven and earth, and he himself would be the temple. As John the Apostle hears the voice of the Lamb in his vision in Revelation, who is seated on the throne, saying, I, have, I am making everything new. It's in that renewed kingdom then that sin and its effect in our lives will be gone. Peace and righteousness, which is ours spiritually today with God at that time, will rule. And the root of Jesse, the banner for the peoples, will be upon that new heaven and earth. And his temple, he will be the temple. And he will be glorious. Because in his church, between God and his people, reigns supreme the power of that cross. And the Messiah is lifted up. And his eternal kingdom of beauty is made perfect. And the relationship with God is fully restored in Jesus and assured to us in an empty tomb. For he is alive forevermore. And because of that, we are forgiven through faith. And we'll live with him forever in heaven. So the prosperity that we seek should not be prosperity in this world. The happiness we long for, which is so fleeting here, will be eternal in the world to come. Because even though worldly prosperity may not be around the corner, Christmas is the celebration of the Word made flesh and the message of the newborn Christ gives happiness in this world to more people in more lives than the prosperity of a thousand lifetimes could ever buy. And we have begun our Christmas preparations now. Let's not give our children and our grandchildren a half-hearted celebration of Jesus which comes around this time each year and whose message is so familiar to our hearts. But when it comes, let's rejoice anew as though it were the first time that we had ever heard it, as though the angels of heaven were singing to us the blessed words of life eternal. This is the happiest time of year for children. It's the happiest time of year for many. And if we can't celebrate it with those we love this year, and we can't celebrate it with them next year, we will celebrate them anew with them in heaven. 
For a shoot has already arisen from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch bears fruit in the gospel of Christ. A virgin did conceive and bear a son, and his name is Jesus. He and the heavenly host burst forth again and again to proclaim his praise. For he is Emmanuel, he is God with us who remains with us until the end of the age. He gave himself to us. He is ours. He belongs to you and to me through the gift of faith. He is our refuge and strength, a very help in trouble. The root of Jesse has brought forth its branch. And lo, he is our redeemer. He is our savior And he is our King. In Jesus' name, amen. Join us for worship Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock with Bible study and Sunday school at 1030. Or find us on the web at emmanuelnrh.net.